Thank you, Andrea. On behalf of Alex, Archana, Michael, and myself, Isabella, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are presenting to you today from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. This land hosts the University of British Columbia, and as students studying there, and in light of the topic we are presenting on today, it's very important to us to not just recognize the painful history Indigenous people living here have endured, but the continued disproportionate marginalization and discrimination that still continues for local nations and for urban Indigenous people who may identify as First Nations, Métis, or Inuit as well. As a city of reconciliation, Vancouver is committed to recognizing the strengths and assets of Indigenous people and communities while working to address systemic barriers and socioeconomic inequities, which is where our work is situated. Decades of planning and policy have sought to achieve a more affordable, inclusive, sustainable, and livable city. Yet despite this effort, many lives are not improving in Vancouver, particularly for Indigenous people. Increasing housing inequality, um, heightened uh, unaffordability, and eroding trust in government are causing many to become anxious. Now more than ever, it has become essential to focus city planning on creating inclusive multicultural spaces that empower residents and are sustainable for future generations. The city of Vancouver hopes to achieve this through its Vancouver plan, a long-term strategic citywide plan. Now in its feedback and scenario planning stage, the Vancouver plan aspires to achieve planning goals for 2050 and beyond. To accomplish these goals, it is necessary to move away from traditionally colonial Western planning practices. In our research, we conducted an academic literature review on Indigenous studies, a jurisdictional scan of cities practicing similar efforts in decolonized urban planning, including Auckland, Edmonton, Melbourne, and Seattle. And lastly, we interviewed 22 individuals from various backgrounds of expertise, including Indigenous studies scholars, urban planners, Indigenous City of Vancouver staff, both former and present, to identify emerging methods of city planning that include Indigenous participation, values, and practices. Our report findings are presented here to you today as three distinct opportunities for the city to ultimately decolonize its Vancouver plan. And so before delving into analysis, we have to first figure out what does decolonization actually mean and what does it look like in practice? Based on our literature review and interviews with experts and Indigenous peoples who work in the field, we have come to understand decolonization as a spectrum rather than a fixed universal practice that has a very clear definition. And even though it's a spectrum that has no beginning and end, um, on the one end of the spectrum here, you can see um, there, there is the cosmetic repackaging of reconciliation often seen as tokenism, where the intentions could be honest, but do little to advance the goals of meaningful reconciliation. When we attended the University of Hawaii's roundtable called Decolonizing City Planning, they gave an example of real estate developers slapping a salmon on expensive condos and calling it decolonization and reconciliation. We believe that the city's inquiry into decolonizing city planning and contacting a colonial audit would and should go beyond that. On the other end of the spectrum, there is a more radical but a logical understanding of decolonization that flows from the seminal work by Eve Tuck and Wang Yang called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. Their thesis states that decolonization brings about the repatriation of indigenous land and life. It is not a metaphor for other things that we want to improve about our societies and schools. One participant, Professor Doug Harris at UBC's law school, echoes a similar view. He said that decolonization is about the dismantling of colonial structures, namely the transfer of land and title and property back to indigenous peoples. As it stands currently, the goal of the city is not to commit to a wholesale immediate transfer of power and property back to the local nations. Fortunately, this work falls on a spectrum. And as, as we have found that there is a middle ground approach called indigenization that sees decolonization as not, as not a binary all or nothing approach, we look into ways of indigenizing, such as unsettling and, um, and unlearning in conjunction with decolonization that can help create an indigenized Vancouver plan. As such, with the recent commitment to more full, fully implement UNDRIP by the City Council, it is important to point out how UNDRIP serves as an overarching framework, and we have extracted several themes that can help advance the goals of indigenizing and decolonizing. So now let, let's see what is UNDRIP 
and recall the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is an international legislative framework that emphasizes the right of Indigenous peoples to maintain and strengthen their own institutions, tradition, culture, and the right to pursue development through their own strat strategies. It also sets up a standard for eliminating the violation of human rights of Indigenous peoples worldwide by combating discrimination and marginalization. The UNTRIP framework was adopted by UN General Assembly in 2007, and then it was formally endorsed by Canada in 2016 while implementing Bill C-262 that emphasizes incorporation of principles of UNTRIP into Canadian law and also calls upon all levels of government within Canada to adopt and implement UNTRIP as their framework for reconciliation. On March 11, 2021, the Vancouver City Council unanimously voted for implementation of UNDRIP as it has already adopted UNDRIP earlier in 2014. The incorporation of UNDRIP principles into Vancouver plan has significant implications. Next slide. Since many of our respondents told that decolonization would be repatriation of resources back to indigenous communities, and instead that should be implementation of, implementation of UNDRIP, which would promote coexistence of multiple communities and has the city of Vancouver has moved forward to implement UNDRIP. Our first opportunity to the city presents how to incorporate UNDRIP principles into Vancouver plan as both Vancouver plan and UNDRIP are, its, are, in, uh, are in its beginning stages, the work would evolve over time. Moreover, our focus here to support urban indigenous peoples who are distinct from MST communities is because is, be is because they face several problems such as lack of identity, cultural connection, employment and education opportunities. So the principles that we have come up with to incorporate UNDRIP are as follows. First one, mutual respect, where the city should consider making room for inclusion of perspectives of indigenous people, urban indigenous peoples at city level planning through continuous and distinct engagement processes, such as having frequent dialogues, Moreover, the city should also maintain transparency in decision making and it should, should provide the urban indigenous peoples with the right to take part in decisions affecting their lives. A second principle is acknowledgement of history and building relationship where the city must create awareness among Vancouver residents regarding the history of not only the local First Nations, but also regarding the history of urban indigenous peoples. This in turn could strengthen mutual understanding and relationship between both non-indigenous and urban indigenous peoples as a result of integrating their values into different domains of the society. Our third and final uh, principle is empowerment, where the city should consider providing urban indigenous peoples with an autonomy to prioritize and develop their own strategies for their economic, political, and social well-being without any discrimination. In the empowerment processes, the city should recognize diversity within the urban indigenous groups and should pay special focus towards the development of elderly, women, children, people with disability, and so on, as these people are found to be deprived of development in most of the cases. While all these are important, the principles of UNDRIP could not be fulfilled without proper consultation. So let's move on to consultation. And consultation is, of course, one of those words that's repeated so often in policy circles that it feels like it could be losing its meaning. In our interview process, we have heard of consultation being treated as a box checking exercise, a mere formality, or worse, an extractive process where planners and policymakers go in to superimpose their understanding of the issues and then considering it done. On the other hand, there is good engagement. There is a proper long-term good engagement processes that include First Nations in vital decision-making processes. And when it's done well, it can strengthen these ongoing relationships that the institutions have with the communities that they serve. The caveat, however, is that the metrics for evaluation would be the quality of the relationship, would be the strength of the connections, and the level of inclusion, none of which are particularly easy to index. And one material problem that we have learned through our interviews is this thing called consultation fatigue, which is namely the inequitable personnel capacity between a city and the local nations which is that they can be consulted, they can review, and they can provide input on every single project from installing a stop sign to providing all manners of public service. 
which is exactly why there is no one size fits all approach and the local nations along with the city need to develop a workable consultation plan on an individual individual nation basis one good example that we have learned in our scan is the city of edmonton's current years indigenous framework uh, which starts which starts any sort of work by seeking out the guidance and wisdom of indigenous elders knowledge keepers in these me meetings, the elders determined that a pipe ceremony was needed to signify the start of work with good intentions and to guide the initiative throughout its process. In Western policy speak, this means letting the elders set the agenda rather than coming in with a pre predetermined agenda. Work directed by the elders is called a spirit-based approach and it signifies the respect to those who know and understand indigenous culture and history and the respect on the land that we're working. The third and final opportunity available for the city of Vancouver is to implement internal decolonization practices. Now, this opportunity recognizes that decolonization is a long term intergenerational process that is both individual and institutional. Now, there is an opportunity for the city planning department to look at internal practices that may allow for a long term decolonization process to take place. Uh, and one of these practices is training. We heard from many participants that knowledge of Indigenous ways of being is lacking within the city planning department and implementing internal decolonization practices can allow for planning staff to learn and to demonstrate knowledge about important Indigenous practices and ways of being. This training could be, uh, this training overall could have rewarding impacts for urban planning practices within the city. Uh, training could be ongoing and reflect current matters relating to Indigenous peoples and the city of Vancouver. Another internal practice includes the hiring and retention of Indigenous staff within the city planning department. We heard from several participants regarding the lack of representation within the planning department and implementing internal decolonization practices could allow the planning department to incorporate Indigenous cultural competency into the hiring process. Uh, for example, this could include specific interview questions that measure knowledge of Indigenous matters. Uh, retention of Indigenous staff is also very important. Indigenous staff had sometimes experienced burnout, often being recruited to speak about Indigenous knowledge in addition to fulfilling their direct obligations. Uh, and retention also includes creating an environment where Indigenous staff can be supported and have opportunities for advancement within the department and with the city of Vancouver overall. Uh, so this brings us back to our understanding of what decolonization of the Vancouver plan looks like. Uh, and based on our research, we are encouraging the city of Vancouver to transition away from a more literal interpretation of full decolonization towards a more inclusive and incremental practice of indigenization of the Vancouver plan. Uh, and to re reiterate our opportunities, we believe this indigenization would include first the opportunity to implement principles of UNDRIP through urban planning, second the opportunity to improve formal consultation with local nations, and third the opportunity to improve internal practices through training, hiring, and retention. So to conclude, um, these opportunities are meant as next steps for the city of Vancouver as it continues work of the Vancouver plan in, a, in an indigenized way. We want to recognize that in the same way the Vancouver plan is long term aspirational for 2050 and beyond decolonizing or indigenizing efforts are long term as well. Our work has made us realize that indigenization of city planning is not completed by one city of Vancouver team or through one GP squared project, but rather indigenization is ongoing multi generational process of self learning and then growing together. We will learn that it will be challenging and most likely uncomfortable, but ultimately this work will be reflected in the city we live in, creating a Vancouver where all residents can prosper. Thank you, we're happy to answer your questions now. Great, thank you to the city of Vancouver team for that great uh, presentation. We'd now like to uh, begin with comments from Susan Haight and Beverly White. Great. Uh, this is Susan Hayden from the City of Vancouver. Um, we just really wanted to express our gratitude um, in the opportunity of working with the team on this project and um, really um, looking at um, 
the way forward in terms of taking the, uh, the recommendations of this study and how we advance uh, work on the Vancouver plan. Um, I think um, we have had the opportunity for this team to connect with our policy working group on uh, reconciliation and decolonization. And I think we, we all jointly acknowledge that we are on uh, the journey and a pathway. And there's, um, it, it's, it's certainly a, a long journey and that in the next year and a half on the Vancouver plan, by no means will we um, achieve the goals of uh, indigenization. Um, but uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's a great partnership and really good work. And um, the, maybe I'll, um, I'll just end with a, a compelling question on, um, for the team on how they would really um, define the difference between decolonization and indigenization. Sure. And, Certainly, I, I yeah, I was going to say. I also want to uh, provide space for uh, my colleague Bev White as well. Um, Beverly really uh, led and coordinated this work from the city side. So, um, yeah, over to her after me. But I would love to hear your thoughts on that question. Thanks, Susan. I'll, I'll jump in, and then maybe we can go to the questions if that sounds good. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo, you know, huge appreciation for all of the, the work and the interviews you've been doing. It's um, really great to see it all come together. And I, I think there's a lot of um, similarities with the sort of conversations happening um, on the Vancouver plan with the Reconciliation Policy Working Group. And I really see these as kind of complementary. Um, it's sort of, it's kind of reassuring to, to see this uh, direction developing. Um, and I mean, I would love to also hear, I know we've got a few of the um, Indigenous uh, staff on the line as well um, from the policy working group and I think um, if you know if there are comments to add in the chat uh, or, or if you want to speak up as well that would be great but um, yeah I'm curious also on the on the definition and I guess another question for me is that we've been kind of thinking of this as um, really it's a long journey and, and we're looking at sort of advancing reconciliation that's kind of the term we've been using um, but you know, re recognizing you're sort of suggesting indigenization um, as maybe a better term to use. Um, I think we as a team and in conversations with the um, First Nations partners feel um, that whatever term we use, it needs to be defined um, because there are so many <laughs> ways it can be defined otherwise. So yeah, I just would love to hear a little bit more about sort of those, um, yeah, that work, the definitions. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, it's so lovely to see you and for all your great feedback. Um, it's been such a pleasure working with you both. Um, in terms of the definition question, um, I can start us off and then I'm going to pass it off to our expert on definitions, Michael. Um, but I'll just say that we created the spectrum because we don't think any of the words are bad, but we wanted to create a distinct idea of a fulsome approach a meaningful reconciliation that didn't necessarily reflect the very literal definitions we found in academic literature and in our interviews that people seem to think decolonization is. So maybe I'll pass it off to Michael to go a little further in depth. Yeah, the definition is kind of, it is the elephant in the room for, for us when we just started our project. And we checked with Professor Cheryl Lightfoot, um, I'm not sure you know her, but she's now the UN representative um, on, the, on the rights of indigenous peoples from North America. Uh, it's mostly an academic one, and it's a historical one, that decolonization started in the mid-century when the kind of third world, so to speak, countries were decolonizing, literally having their land and property and title and power handed back to them. And so we're going to use the same approach as the historical definition of decolonization, and this is supported by uh, the seminal work that we mentioned earlier by Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang uh, called Decolonization is on a Metaphor, then the city would have to commit to essentially transfer of title and property and power. And we, we don't think we're there yet. That might be the future. And indigenization, which is also, it's, it's used in the UPC's plan as well. It, it kind of offers a middle ground approach because I think I think it's Professor Shirley that said it. Um, we understand that settlers, immigrants are not going anywhere. We're not 
you know, no one is going anywhere. We need to figure out a way that can be empowering for everyone involved. And really it's to, to emphasize on the co-management co and the government to government basis on which we have to move forward and to indigenize Vancouver rather than ripping things apart, dismantling colonial structure. It's kind of um, finding the positive in a history of trauma and colonization. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Susan or Bev, do you have any further questions? Not, a, not at the moment. I'd certainly love to make space for, I see there's uh, questions in the chat. And as Bev mentioned, we have um, colleagues and, and leaders in terms of our Indigenous planning staff with us. So we'd definitely like to make space for, for others. Wonderful. All right. So then uh, we'll open up to the floor. Uh, we'll start with Andrea Reimer, who was the faculty lead on the project, and then we'll move to the questions in the chat. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so great to see your presentation today, you guys. Really well done. Um, and thank you to the City of Vancouver staff um, for coming today, and especially in large numbers, and particularly to note that I messed up the time. So I appreciate your last minute um, working to get here. I, I can't thank you enough for that. Um, so to the team, the last two teams of mine that went, the Squamish and the Mishka, um, well, they had a lot of technical and logistics challenges given all the moving pieces. Um, climate change, I mean, we know a lot about it, right? There's a ton of research and there's clear pathways forward. Um, you were kind of in the opposite position. You're um, in Vancouver, you know, you didn't have to deal with elections or in and out of scope, um, or sorry, um, pandemic hotspots. Um, but you did have to deal, sorry, with in and out of scope, um, like who you could talk to, who you couldn't talk to. And so I'm curious, which of the research you did most informed? And can you speak a bit to what was in scope and what was out of scope for you? Definitely. I'm happy to start and then I'll pass it off. Um, so in terms of what was in scope, um, our main deliverable was a jurisdictional scan of similar cities that were approaching um, emerging efforts on decolonizing city planning, urban planning. Um, so we looked at a number of cities, um, mostly within uh, United States, um, other regions in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, however, I would say that to the second part of your question, also remaining in scope was talking to City of Vancouver staff, um, present and former, um, Indigenous or not. Um, I think those participant interviews really informed the bulk of sentiment at the city of wanting to create change and moreover impactful and meaningful change. Um, and that was like a really positive thing that I experienced. Um, I would say though, what was out of scope um, is um, contacting or consultation with, or having interview participants from the local nations. Um, and that's because we really recognize the um, very meaningful relationship building that is occurring um, on a government to government basis, as Michael was saying, between the local nations and the city of Vancouver. And um, in a 15 and a half week project, it's not nearly enough time to create the meaningful relationships that have taken so long to uh, work up to at the city and the local nations. Um, did anyone else want to add? Okay. Just, yeah, one, one little comment would be, um, it is also the scope for us to evaluate what the consultation process actually looked like that the city has set mm -hmm. up with the, with the local three nations. But um, through our search, and, and this is kind of how we initially conceive it and how it turned out, we were going to go talk to different city planners from other jurisdictions, academics about best practices, and most of them haven't even started this conversation. So the city of Vancouver is way ahead of the curve. It's still there's lots of work to be done, but we were way ahead that we have at least started to um, sincerely trying to implement UNDRIP and then move forward 
Great. All right. Thanks, team. And, and thank you, Andrea. And we have a little bit of time still to move into the chat. So I see some appreciative comments from Marie Beck, who's the senior Indigenous planner. So thank you, Marie. Uh, the first question is from Claire Ross, and she has a question around measurement and what met metrics would be used to analyze a project like this. She's curious to know how you would measure something like decolonization. Uh, thank you, Claire, for your great question. Um, I'm actually going to turn it to Alex because although it wasn't, um, we didn't have enough time to present in our report, we did have a section on metrics and how difficult uh, metrics of success can be in this context. Sure, thanks Isabella and thanks Claire for the question. Um, it's certainly, um, you know, looking at metrics was uh, something that we were tasked with doing and, and whatever those metrics will look like, um, we um, kind of approached it that way. Um, but uh, we heard, based on our research, particularly through some of our participants' interviews, we heard that um, traditional ways of measuring success may not work in a reconciliation, decolonization, and indigenization context. Um, so with some more of the scholarly work we looked at, um, we are encouraging more of a, a developmental evaluation approach which really differs from a more traditional evaluative method when we're looking at program development, program management. Um, so with um, more traditional evaluation methods, um, you'll kind of predetermine those metrics, the program or the project will take place. And then afterwards, you'll conduct some kind of follow-up or analysis or evaluation. That's more the traditional way. Um, with the developmental evaluation, it's much more iterative. It's much more adaptable. Um, and it's much more um, responsive to um, kind of the current climate, especially when it comes to some of these very, um, you know, high level and long term, as we said, inter intergenerational um, um, conversations. Um, you know, these metrics need to be evaluated kind of based on the current climate and the context. So with that de de developmental evaluation uh, approach, um, you'll be able to um, you know, make quick recommendations, you know, evaluate metrics, whether that's around um, hiring of Indigenous um, staff, whether that's um, consulting um, or engaging with local First Nations. So that developmental evaluation is really able to um, uh, kind of adapt to the current processes and, and really respond uh, in a much more um, effective manner. Great, Th thanks Alex. We just have a couple more minutes for one last question. Uh, so this question is coming from Esther. Uh, she says, given your assessment of the often exploitative or performative nature of consultation and having to virtually conduct your research or, and consultation, she was wondering how you integrated this awareness into your research proce process. And she also notes great and informative presentation. Thank you, Esther. Um, that's a really great question and I think something we worth thinking about, um, definitely at the start, but also throughout. Um, in my personal experience, maybe I'll speak a bit on my interview processes and then I, we can move on to other team members. Um, I just felt it was really important to be upfront at the onset of participant interviews. Um, acknowledging is something as simple as acknowledging in an email um, when you're initially reaching out that you recognize the very sensitive and emotional um, context with which you could possibly be speaking in because you're speaking to people's personal experiences. Um, also in light of COVID, a lot of people don't have the bandwidth or emotional or like psychological capacity to take on a lot of this information, which is something we saw um, in some responses we got back um, when seeking out interviews. And I think creating just a very open interview space, I know it's on Zoom, which can be a little awkward and a little boxed in, um, literally. Um, but I think the more informal we were, the better, not just like relationship we built with our interview participants, but the better answers we got as well, because there was a level of trust and understanding there. Well, I would just like to add to like Isabella's answer. So like how we build the understanding was like we went ready reading more about indigenous history and doing more jurisdictional scan from different um, regions of the world so that we were able to like um, tell them like what we read uh, and ask them like what they think. So it was like easy in building up the conversation and going in flow with the interview 